Yeah. Hey, listen, if he loses, if he loses, I'm going to DM him. Do it. Black clock. Yeah. All right. I'm all good. <laughs> there you go, man. <laughs> Bye, bad dude. Sorry for the late delay, everybody. Obviously, we're having a little bit of technical difficulties, but that's right. You are watching Knockouts in Three Counts, and we are live, obviously, with your LFA champion, Jimmy the Brick Flick. How you doing, brother man? Hi, man. I'm doing good, man. Here at the gym, finishing up. Man, ready I to do that. this interview. Well, tell us a little bit about that, man. Let everybody know where they can find you, and uh, let them know where they can uh, be watching you next. Hi, right, man. Uh, you can follow me at Jimmy the Brick Flick on uh, my fan page. My Facebook is all maxed out on friends. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Jimmy Flick and on Instagram at the underscore brick underscore MMA. I'm getting ready for the Tuesday night contender. I'll be taking on 6-0 and Nate Smith and his O's got to go, baby. Hey, that's what I like, man. And that's right. You can you can find that man everywhere you said you found him. Like I said, if you're already following us, you already know. But find us at, at KO3C Pod on all the Instagram, all the social media. So let's talk about that first. So as we were talking about before we went on the air, uh, one of our guests, Kenny Cross, just fought in the first fight tonight for um, the Dana White's Contender Series. So with your fight that you've got coming up, is this your – you know, how long have you known about it? And did they change your opponent up at all? Because for Kenny, Kenny told us that he knew before his last fight that he took here on the regional scene that they were going to bring him in. So did you know about the fight ahead of time? Uh, no, we won the LFA title and we knew to just stay ready. Um, my opponent, Nate Smith, was supposed to be fighting J.B. Buys. J.B. Buys uh, had a, uh, some contract issues or uh, visa issues. And they contacted me four weeks from whenever I fight. So early August uh, is when they contacted me uh, exactly four weeks out. So I've had four weeks to get ready for this. Uh, and my boy, Matt Dixon's actually fighting uh, Cross's brother right now. So I'm watching that as we speak, man. And uh, Matt Dixon's from Tulsa, Oklahoma as well. So talk a little bit about that. So is he a regular training partner for you? And if so, what does that do for you having another guy who's getting his shot on the Dana White Contender Series in your camp getting ready for the same thing? Uh, no, actually, we don't train together. We actually have a few times, but he's a lot bigger than me. Uh, he trains at a different gym, um, but we know each other well. We support each other, and uh, I hope the best for him, and I imagine he hopes the best for me as well. We fought on multiple cards together, and uh, – I think we're both looking to earn that UFC contract and make it one step closer for our hometown. Hey, man, that's kind of – so tell me a little bit about that. I don't know much about the Oklahoma scene. Obviously, we're based out of Detroit. Um, is there a lot of your guys that are coming out right now? I mean, obviously, there's a lot of guys we've seen from Oklahoma, but, like, what's, uh, what's the scene been like over there as far as guys coming up? Because I know here in Michigan, we've had probably somewhere in the range of seven to eight guys in the last – couple months that have all gotten their shots either on the contender series or a UFC fight pass card for maybe an LFA or whatever. So is it, is it, is MMA still going as hot there and as many guys getting shots with all this stuff with the fight still running out there in Oklahoma? Um, right now, man, uh, not really. Uh, our guys are just now getting into it. Uh, our gyms are getting bigger. Our names are getting bigger here. Um, the problem with this is Gerald Harris, if you know who he is, he was one of the biggest names to come out of here out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. And uh, Josh Bryant was on one of the old Ultimate Fighters, and uh, he was one of the biggest names to come out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. So me and Matt Dixon are hoping to be the next ones. I know that uh, Kyle, Kyle, uh, what's his name? Um, there's another guy. Uh, that's making his way up, but he trains at AKA. Uh, Kyle Crushman, who's the other one? Uh, Kyle Driscoll. They're also here locally out of here, but they train at AKA now. So they're making a name as well in a different organization uh, in Bellator. But I believe Kyle Driscoll is going to be on the Tuesday night contenders here soon as well. So I think locally me and uh, Matt Dixon's are the top right now outside of Gerald Harris trying to make his comeback. So, uh, we're looking to make the scene a lot bigger here in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Hey, I like it. 
Corey, I've been running my mouth for a minute here, so I know you had questions you were talking about ahead of time. What do you got for the champ? Well, I mean, earlier I was going to try to squeeze it in, but with, with these damn Zoom calls, it's so hard to, uh, you know, know when the audio break actually comes in. But like you said, man, especially coming off the last performance in LFA, man, you, I'm sure you, you kind of knew you had to be ready that the phone was going to be ringing with, you know. I mean, that, that was a sub-minute submission, wasn't it? I mean, I know you literally – you, you took it to him so quick. You you attempted the single leg from one side, got the double leg from the other, it appeared, and took him down immediately, got to the uh, head and arm choke, and it took the fight. And like I said, I, I believe it was under a minute, wasn't it? Yes, sir. It was 38 seconds. We came out. We threw that calf kick. I seen my single leg there. I hit the single leg. I've wrestled my whole life. So uh, he did a good job at defending the single leg. So we cut back the other way, wrestling my whole whole life. We cut back the other way, finished that double leg, and I jumped right from my head and arm. I'm a brown belt in jiu-jitsu. Uh, I've been a brown belt for eight years now. So uh, I'm very confident in my ground game. I've been wrestling since I was three years old. So uh, it all adapted very well for me. So coming off the 38-second win, we knew that we were going to get the call soon. We was hoping it was going to be straight into the UFC, but uh, when they call, we can't say no. So uh, it's the Tuesday night contender. So we got one more fight to go get a win and uh, earn that UFC contract in front of Dana White. Well, now I've, I've been asking, because we've been getting quite a few contender series guys on here. And I, I, I actually feel as though, even though I agree, it is better to obviously get in the UFC, have the contract in hand, know what you're already getting into. But with the Contender Series, you have so many eyes on it. I mean, it's its own card just for the up-and-coming guys. They really do a good job of breaking down fighter stories and stuff like that. It really does a good job of promoting people on their way up. So, in my eyes, it kind of almost benefits people working their way into the UFC to kind of get that push from the fans early. Do you agree, or would like you said? I mean, the contract's always a nice thing to have in hand, but how how does that make you know? How do you feel? Uh, the only thing tough about the Tuesday night contender is that you go and fight, and there's five fights. I mean, you can get a win, and that does not guarantee you a UFC contract. I mean, we just seen uh, one of the guys on LFA. He was coming off of a dominating win on the Tuesday night contender, and he still had to go back and fight for the LFA title. And he's still waiting on his call. Um, so you never know where you're going to go from there. Um, so you know you have to be exciting. Um, I was exciting in my LFA fight. Um, got that win. Uh, I'm actually 3-0 and in LFA with all finishes. One in round one, one in round two, and one in round three. With uh, one being over UFC vet Johnny Bedford at a higher weight class at 135. And uh, Johnny Bedford's the bare knuckle world champ now. And... Uh, so I've fought high caliber of guys, so I feel I'm more than ready. I do think it's going to help my fan base a lot. Uh, I have over 3,000 followers on my uh, fan page, and I'm only looking to get more. So fighting on ESPN Plus uh, is going to be awesome. And also I get another opportunity to fight with no fans. So I'm just getting more experience the more opportunities I get. And uh, no matter what it is, man, I, I, I'm just excited to be able to do what I like to do for a living. Yeah. So that, that brings that brings up ahead. a good question that I have for you, though. So, you know, you mentioned, you know, you, you've gotten wins over Bellator vets and things like that. But a lot of people who may not know as much about you, maybe if they tuned into LFA, uh, you know, maybe on UFC Fight Pass with obviously there's a lot more people watching fights right now with, you know, all the COVID stuff. You know, you fought already in Bellator. You know, you fought a few UFC vets here. You know, obviously, you're the LFA champion. You're also the FCF champion. I mean, you've – I mean, it's not like you haven't been winning at a high level for a while. So, my question is, heading into this fight, how does your experience against high-caliber opponents such as the ones I named, you know, how does that prepare you for that? Does that take away any of the pressure that's going to come with the Dana White Contender Series, or are you somebody who welcomes it? Uh, man, I don't take pressure into this stuff, man. I work a full-time job. I got a 401k. I got benefits. 
I own my house. I got two and a half acres. I'm well taken care of. My family's taken care of. I just, this is just what I love to do, man. So there's no pressure for me. Uh, we, we just got the opportunity to make it, man. And if we don't make it, I've already made it in life. And like you said, I beat UFC vets. I've uh, lost the UFC vets. Uh, I'm undefeated in Bellator. I'm undefeated in LFA. That's the coach right there, baby. Uh, hey, the man behind the plan. So uh, I'm super excited just for the opportunity with no matter what happens. Uh, I love the experience. I love the grind of this sport. And uh, I can't wait to get out there and showcase my skills in front of Dana White. Uh, my opponent, uh, he hasn't fought the caliber of guys I fought. Uh, my opponent's combined record is 140 wins and 69 losses compared to his 22 and 17, I believe, is what his opponent's combined record is. But he trains out at a very good gym where he trains at uh, Team uh, Elevation or Elevation. So, and he's a junior Olympian. Uh, he's wrestled his whole life. So I'm not taking nothing from him. But like I said, his O's got to go. And there's no better way to do it than to do it in front of Dana White himself. So that's a good point. So you mentioned the combined records of your opponents versus your opponent's opponents. Um, one thing that we've seen as a common thread with what's been going on, uh, obviously, with the Kender, Contender Series so far, I mean, there's been a lot of great fights this season, but there's also been a lot of opponent changes. So with you going into this fight, you know, do you – do you if say you get in there and they do like you did with who we just mentioned, like Kenny Cross, does the do – the, does the change in opponents, like if they change your opponents up or if something changes – does that change anything for you? Or is it just another day in the another day in the office? Yeah, man, it's just another day in the office, man. Either way, whoever I get in there with, we're trying to punch each other in the face. We're trying to get a win, and we're trying to just get one step closer to our dream of making it to the UFC. We see this stuff happen in the UFC all the time. These guys got to be ready on days, two days notice, you know, in the UFC. So uh, Nate Smith, he's actually been supposed to fight JB Bice since like earlier this year and the pandemic pushed it back and then now jb buys uh uh visa didn't go through and now he's fighting me so um it, we're fighters at the end of the day and it doesn't matter who's in there we're going to try to punch each other in the face and we're going to try to get the job done all right so as obviously you're trying to make your way into the ufc i'd love to hear you know your thoughts on the division obviously you're the flyweight champion for lfa and things like that for those of you who watch the sport, you all know that Henry Cejudo just stepped down over there. Um, what are your thoughts on the flyweight division as a whole? Because for most people that watch the fights, you know, I mean, the lighter guys are always sometimes more fun to watch because of how much more output they have and things of that nature. Um, what are your thoughts on the flyweight division now that things are opened up? Do you think that this creates more opportunity for a guy like you who's on his way in maybe to be able to get more fights because people seem a little bit hesitant to fight right now, obviously with COVID and, you know, the different training style and all that. Do you think that this presents more opportunity for you to get more fights in in a hurry? Oh, yeah, most definitely. Look at Brandon Roy Bell, the LFA champ before me. He got a short notice fight with Tim Sil or Tim Elliott. And he won that fight. Now he's currently ranked number 11 after his first fight in the UFC. Now he's fighting the number eight guy in the UFC. And it looks like he's going to be on a pay-per-view card. So, uh, and uh, I've moved up to 35 a couple times because I thought the flyweight division was going to be cut. So now that the flyweight division is solidified, I'm super happy that Cody Garbrandt is moving down to fight because Cody Garbrandt, brings a whole different fan base to the flyweight division. I don't think he's going to win the flyweight title, but I do think it's going to bring more fans to the flyweight division. So I think that was a smart move for the UFC. I'm super excited that they did that. And, uh, yeah, I'm looking to go get this win and earn my UFC contract and turn around and be ready to get another fight this year if I need to. I've currently had uh, – I've currently had uh, three fight. this will be my third fight this year already. I have two fights in the first round, and if we could get another one in the first round, that'd be amazing. And I think the flyweight division's opening up. There's a lot of guys getting signed, and we're very exciting. So uh, I, I'm excited to see what happens. So if, uh, you know, 
do you see yourself when you – I'm going to just say it ahead of time. When you make it into the UFC, obviously we're not looking ahead of your fight coming September 1st, but do you see yourself bouncing back and forth between 125 and 35, keep going forward depending on what fights are available, or do you want to stay at a certain weight once you – you know, if you make it to the big show? Oh, yeah, I want to stay at flyweight. That's where I belong. Uh, I, most of my losses are at 135. The guys are a lot bigger and stronger than me. I can make 35 on a 24 hours notice. And uh, if the UFC needed me this Saturday for a 35 fight, if one of the guys fell through, I, I would be more than happy to step up to get my shot in the UFC. But I want to fly, fight at flyway. That's where I belong. That's where I feel I'm the best at. And uh, I'm a bigger, stronger flyway than I am a bantamweight. So, uh, but like I said, if the UFC calls and offers something, I, I can't say no. Just like when they offered me the Tuesday night contender, even though I feel I wanted to go straight to the UFC, you can't say no to them. So uh, I'm excited for all opportunities that come my way from here on out. So can you talk a little bit about one thing that you said uh, in one of the questions I asked just a little bit earlier? You know, you mentioned how you're, you're at financial freedom, where a lot of guys, you know, they're trying to make it into the UFC so they can make that money and kind of, you know, better their lives. Do you feel that the fact that you're kind of, like you said, you know, set up and okay, kind of regardless of where the, how the fight ends up or what your fighting career does, do you think that that makes you, does it make it a little bit easier for, for you when you step into the cage? Does it give you kind of one less thing to worry about and give you a little bit more peace in the cage? Oh, yeah, most definitely, man. Uh, a lot of guys put too much pressure on their self, you know, saying they have to make it. They got to make it, you know. If they don't make it, they don't know what they're going to do. They quit their jobs for this opportunity. Um, my job works with me. I've been at my job for almost five years. They also sponsor me. Uh, I told them last week I head out to Vegas next week, and I'm going to be out in Vegas for uh, a whole week before I'm able to come back and go back to work. And my job was 100% okay with it. So I love my job, Tulsa Plastics. And we've been putting out plastic like crazy. And uh, I'm in the plastic industry. So we've been super busy with this pandemic. But I'm very thankful for my job because we were able to stay open during the pandemic. I didn't have to worry about hurting for money. And they also let me fly out to Sioux Falls, South Dakota and fight for the LFA flyweight title. So, um, yeah, I mean – I can't be more excited than all my opportunities that come my way. And I can't be more excited for my job for all the support. So that brings up a good question of itself. Like you mentioned in the beginning of the show, you know, you were talking about your following, which I found out real quick in a hurry when we were trying to promote this thing, just how many guys, guys and girls that you've got, you know, supporting you, you know, in these fights, because I mean, as soon as we announced that we were going to bring you on this week, I mean, social media blew up pretty quick. So, I mean, you've done a good job, um, you know, putting yourself out there with social media and that kind of stuff, you know, as you go forward in your fight career, you know, you mentioned that you're working full time and things like that. How, how much, how much, uh, for me anyways, and the reason I bring this question up, I work for the post office. So like you guys, we're not shutting down. There ain't no way we're shutting down. We're open 24 seven. So do you think uh, having a job like that that does that, does that help you at all going into fights? Because I would imagine, you know, with as busy as you guys are talking, that's kind of got to put your mind, you know, on something else other than the fight. Obviously, you're getting closer to fight week, which I'm sure that changes it. But, you know, do you, with you still working, does that help you a little bit? Because I feel like a lot of guys we've been bringing on, they've talked about the mental strain that training right now has brought on them with all the COVID stuff. Yeah, I mean, it gets mentally tough, man. Uh, that's for sure. Um, but, yeah, the more supportive everybody is, like my following and everything. When I fought in LFA, we had multiple watch parties back here in Tulsa. I sold over 140 fight shirts um, locally and even some in a couple states where I shipped out. I have a lot of sponsors. I have a lot of supporters. And it motivates me to push harder, especially at nights. Like today when I came into the gym, I wasn't feeling the best. But – when I got in here and started putting that work in, I knew I had to give it everything I got. There's no reason to be in the gym and not give it 100%. If you show up, might as well give it everything you got. That's what my dad always told me. It's kind of pointless to come in and just lollygag. If you're here, put the work in, do it, you know. 
And uh, with my support system and everybody that helps me and supports me, it just motivates me more. Uh, my job, they let me off work whenever I need to leave work. And uh, it, it helps me mentally a lot. So I feel I'm a lot mentally tough than a lot of these guys. And uh, growing up as a wrestler, it's helped me with my work ethic. I have an amazing work ethic, and that's what helps me push in these fights. And that's why uh, I was able to finish Johnny Bedford in the third round. If you go back and watch that fight, we had a good first round, second round, but I seen Johnny was breaking. And then third round, I pushed as hard as I could. I got that submission, and I put him to sleep. And uh, I earned the biggest win of my career. So now we're still on that grind. I've been in this sport for over a decade as a professional. So uh, I, I'm ready to go out there and showcase all my skills. Uh, I'm more mentally tough than anybody I feel in the flyweight division, and I'm ready to show it. So Johnny Bedford is a name all of us here in Michigan know very well because he's fought a lot uh, for WXC and, you know, him and uh, past guest of our show who just made his UFC de debut a few weeks ago, Justin James had quite the thing going on here as well. So you mentioned with you being from uh, Oklahoma, what are things like down there? I know here in Michigan, things are pretty much still kind of like shut down they're shut down, but they're not shut down. So how hard was Oklahoma really hit with all this stuff with the pandemic and all that? And what's daily life for you guys like right now with things starting to open up a little bit? Oh uh, man. Yeah. We were shut down for a little bit. We had our gym shut down. Uh, the gym I'm at right now though, uh, we opened back up a couple weeks after the pandemic. So we was able to get over here and get the work in. Um, a lot of us are wearing the mask uh, in Tulsa. Everybody is are not recommended. It is a, uh, it's a executive order. Yes, basically. Yeah. So we all have to wear it. Like when I go into Walmart and everything like that, everybody's wearing the mask. I wear the mask at work all the time right now. So it's kind of turned into a daily thing. I happen to wear the mask. Um, we are pretty open up with restaurants and stuff stuff like that we just have to wear the mask and uh my kid even went to a birthday party at a jump place the other day so um we're getting back to opening up pretty good just they recommend everybody wearing the mask right now so uh i, I just hope everything will be over with soon and uh it'll open more doors for some of us fighters and uh we even have shows going on here in oklahoma right now with fans the regionals the regionals Yes, we just had one on UFC Fight Pass called XFN. They had that heavyweight kickboxing I saw that. A friend of mine fought yeah. for them. So they eliminated, eliminated the uh, the ticket sales and spread out the seating for everybody. And down in Oklahoma, there's a company called Rage, Rage in the Cage. They're on like their third, third or fourth show. Uh, Brian Foster, a lot of y'all might know as well. He has an MMA company as well, and he just had a show here in Oklahoma where he main he was the main event for the show. So Oklahoma, I feel, is one of the first states that's opened up and has been allowing a lot more stuff to be happening. So did you get to go to that fight? Uh, I didn't. I, I had my kids that night. So uh, I, I got a three-year-old and I got an eight-year-old. So uh, with my schedule – That takes priority. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> training and working – and I, I'm also in the process of uh, opening up a business for my wife. Uh, she's a nail technician. So uh, we got to kind of work our schedule together. She's graduated school. So uh, we really work together with each other. And she follows me and my dream. And I'm following her and her dream. So uh, I didn't get to go, but I did watch it on UFC Fight Pass. But, yeah, Oklahoma has opened up to have some shows. And I was actually hoping the UFC would come back here. Uh, they were trying to come here when the pandemic first hit and they were going to go to the casino uh, because it's on tribal land. And right. they were going to show until it got shut down by whoever shut that down. So, uh, yeah, Oklahoma's uh, opened up pretty much uh, a lot. So that brings a very good question. So you mentioned that you guys are already running fights. I know here in Michigan, uh, Matt Frendo, who's another past guest of the show, he's uh, the one who runs Lights Out Championship here. Lights Out's been on a lot of the big ones just like that. That's where Kenny was fighting, you know, ahead of getting his shot with the Contender Series. I know that I just heard probably week, week and a half ago, they're getting ready to run uh, fights here. Uh, they said it's going to be an empty arena thing. Obviously, like I'm sure it may have been something similar in Oklahoma, but you said they had fans here. They're talking about running them. But uh, if I'm not mistaken, the guidelines that they have laid out so far is that we can run fights, 
but amateurs can't fight. And uh, in order for them to run fights, it's still got to be like very social distance and stuff. So the fact that you guys are already getting fans back in there is a huge step. Yeah, man. Like you said, and there's been multiple shows with fans already. I think the first one was back in August where they had fans. So uh, there's been, uh, like I said, four or five shows with fans. I know it's a limited amount of fans and there's amateurs fighting as well. Uh, we even got some guys going to fight in, uh, some smokers this weekend uh, that have fans as well. Uh, some of our amateur Muay Thai guys. So uh, I hope everybody else starts to follow and I hope the pandemic starts fading off. But I feel like it's going to be around until about November, until the election. And I uh, think it'll <laughs> So we'll see what happens. So, yeah, I have, to, I have to agree with you on the whole November part. But while we're on the topic of the uh, whole COVID and everything, um, how do, are you nervous at all coming into the uh, Contender Series fight, going through? I'm sure you're going to have to go through some type of quarantine and, you know, testing going into the fight. Does that make you nervous whatsoever, or have you done any testing before you plan on leaving? What's kind of the the role on that? Do you know? Uh, we got tested up in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, when I got there, okay. uh, and the UFC just contacted me. They're sending me a COVID test, I guess that you can do, and you send it back off to them, and then they'll get it checked. That worries me more than anything. Yeah. For me to put all this work in and then for a COVID test to come back and screw up my opportunity would be the worst feeling in the world. But uh, I feel everything happens for a reason. So no matter what happens, uh, we're just going to take it on the heart and uh, go with it, you know. But we hope for the best. I hope Nate Smith and his cornermen are good to go. I hope that I I'm good to go and my cornermen's good to go. And we're able to head out there next week. And uh, I head out there a week early to do my media and stuff. And then I'll be out there until fight night. So I'll have a week to adapt to the altitude. So I'm excited about that. And, and I'm just excited for the opportunity, man. Win, lose, or draw, I'm coming with everything I got. And the end result is I want to earn that UFC contract. And I want Dana White to be on his feet. Um, that's what I want. And I mean, I want me and Nate to go to war and I want us to excite Dana and I want him, us to show that the flyweight division is a, a division to be reckoned with. Well, I think your last performance really showed that. And I think that's exactly why they picked you for this spot is to kind of put a good shine on the division itself. And one more thing I wanted to preference was you, you got another planned list of, uh, sponsorships for after the fight i noticed that kind of went a little viral for you after the fact of your last fight unfortunately with the tuesday night contender we're not allowed to do that man it's like in the ufc we're uh, not yeah, allowed yeah. To sponsors but if you watch my social media that's all i do I, I give sponsor blasts and i don't know why more fighters don't do that social media is free advertisement so you need to take advantage of it if you're a fighter and advertise your sponsors as much as possible. Uh, my sponsors support me a lot. They've taken great care of me to help me where I'm able to take off work, be able to afford to take off work. Uh, the gym I'm at right now is literally 45 minutes away from my house. So when I leave here, I got a 45 drive home. Uh, I make that drive four times, sometimes five times a week. Um, I also live about 30, 30 minutes from a, uh, my job so uh the gas money the uh wear and tear i put on my truck um thanks to my sponsors they help me out a lot with that also with my privates uh i got privates with my striking coach privates with jujitsu uh coaches so it costs money to be able to do all that and if i didn't have all my sponsors that supported me it'd be a lot harder to make it in the sport so you just hit on something that um, – it's something that we've talked about a lot here, and it leads into a question I'm going to ask you after this. But obviously, as we mentioned when we were talking before we went on air, you know, our show covers pro wrestling and MMA, and that's one of the biggest things we've heard from the wrestling end. I, for the life of me, can't understand why when, you know, you're bringing a guy on the show or, like, you know, he's got a fight going on, social media, even though it's one of the biggest tools you have, I feel like goes uh, underutilized by a lot of the guys that we're seeing in today's MMA game. Um, 
Let's talk about that, though. So, obviously, we know you like to fight. We know you like to be around your kids, and rightfully so. But when you're not in fight camp and you're not hanging out with your kids, what does Jimmy the Brick Flick like to do in his free time, man? Are you a Call of Duty guy, a Warzone guy? Do you like to go hunting? What, do, what are you doing when you're not in a cage, bro? Man, that's the thing, dude. Being a family man, a working man, and trying to chase my dream, that's what I do, man. I, 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 if I'm not – uh, with my family or working, uh, I'm in the gym getting that training in. Uh, I like to hang out with my buddies, you know. Uh, I'm not a big drinker or anything like that. So uh, most of the time, besides hanging out with friends and family and doing little stuff like that, I don't have time to do anything else. Uh, so uh, my hobby, when everybody asks what's my hobby, <laughs> is my hobby. Training is my hobby. Uh, I don't have time for nothing else outside of that with uh, as busy as I am and also with my wife I just like to support my wife as much as she supports me and uh, I love spending time with my girls they know that daddy likes to pow pow uh, that's what we're <laughs> so uh, I haven't forced it on them yet but my eight-year-old does want to do Muay Thai so we're gonna get her over here to start doing Muay Thai here soon we had her in gymnastics but gymnastics just wasn't for her so uh, it didn't work out for her so now we're about to try to get her over here to do some Muay Thai and um, maybe that'll turn into a daddy daughter thing and uh, if it does awesome I'd be happy for it but if not I'm not going to push it on my girls at all so I love that because that brings up uh, something that I've said because um, I have a little sister who's about five years younger than me I started boxing when I was about 13 or so so I have pushed for my sister to train in some form of martial arts, whether it's jujitsu, boxing, whatever, just so that she had, you know, like that base for you as a father. Um, what do you think are the biggest benefits for your kids, like getting to train? And for me, I, one of the biggest reasons I'm an advocate for it is because I feel like it also, you know, curves a lot of stuff with bullying. If somebody knows they got something to look forward to, they're going to be a lot less likely to fuck with you when, you know, they know they might get a fist to the mouth. So for you as a dog, having, you know, children, what do you think the importance is of self-defense for kids in 2020, man? Yeah, um, yeah, man. Uh, it's a good benefit for self-defense, especially my, my girls are beautiful, man. And uh, <laughs> the way this world is, man, we got pedophiles. We got a lot of weird, nasty people out in this world, man. And uh, it looks like a lot more stuff is coming out throughout this pandemic with, uh, you know, Save Our Children and all kinds of stuff, uh, human trafficking and everything like that. So for my little girl to be able to defend herself, know how to fight off people, and also not worry about getting bullied as she gets older, um, it'd be great. I know that uh, after I won the FCF title, we went to her school and I showed off the title to all the kids, kind of scared them <laughs> little boys a little bit, you know, because they know her daddy's a fighter. So uh, <laughs> that's pretty cool as well. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I work with her a little bit right now. I just don't want to push it on her. But as she gets older, they're going to know how to defend themselves for sure because this world is a messed up place. Well, hey, as, I a, as, a father of, uh, as a father of two girls myself, I completely feel you on that, man. I got a, a soon-to-be six and a soon-to-be uh, four-year-old, so I feel you there. We do, actually, uh, past guests of the show from last week, we had uh, Miles Jury, who fights in Bellator now, past UFC vet. Yeah. He, uh, he, we were actually having a very similar conversation because he has his four-year-old uh, son in jiu-jitsu. Just got and his I'm first kinda, strike. Look at Mac. Yeah, and I'm kind of at that same point. Like, you know, my, my daughter is getting to that age, and once things start opening back up, it would be cool to kind of, you know, get her in the gym. And like you were just saying, I mean, what would you recommend for a kid that age to start with? As somebody who's seasoned in MMA and actually got quite a few fights under their belt, what would you recommend? Would you jitsu be the first thing you put your kid in? Uh, Jiu-jitsu or wrestling? Uh, wrestling's really good. Uh, um, now they, they're also bringing wrestling for females, you know, where fe females wrestle females. Uh, growing up, uh, 
I wrestled females and females had to wrestle us. They never got to wrestle each other. The sport's finally getting big enough where they can wrestle each other, which is pretty freaking cool. And then uh, I, I love uh, jujitsu. And I think jujitsu is a great way too, because it, a lot of men that don't do jujitsu wouldn't know how to defend it off if they were trying to, you know, kidnap a little girl or do anything like that. It's a lot easier to put somebody to sleep with the choke than it is to try to knock somebody out, especially if they're a lot bigger than you. Um, but here at my gym at Forza Combat Sports, would they have an amazing kid program? And I come in and I watch these kids, you know, beat up the bag and stuff like that. So I think it's a great develop for them. Uh, I don't think fighting very young is very smart until you get older, but I don't, I, I got into wrestling at three years old. So by the time I was 16, 17 years old, uh, I started getting more out from wrestling, you know? So I started venturing out, being dumb, you know, hanging out with the wrong crowd and got myself in some trouble. I think if I would have waited a little longer to join the sports, it, it might've benefited me a lot more. And my dad didn't push it on me so much. So that's why I don't want to push it on my little girl so much. So I love the fact that she's been asking me to do it. So I'm going to make sure I get her in here. And I, I recommend jujitsu and wrestling to start out. But I don't think learning how to strike is anything bad either. Not at all. Yeah. No, I, I, I mean, you absolutely need to at least learn, you know, the basics with striking, especially if you're going to take any type of, you know, any type of martial arts class, really. Um, but that being said, um, go on, Kyle. I seen you had a question fired up. I do have a question. I want to ask you something that's a little off kilter, a little MMA, a little bit off the MMA block. So obviously, I'm sure in all these interviews you do, obviously MMA is the number one thing you're talking about. As I mentioned, our show also covers pro wrestling. So does Jimmy the Brick Flick fuck with wrestling at all? If so, was it? any of the older stuff was there any favorites anything like that have you ever been a wrestling guy at all uh earlier when i was younger i was i've actually got to go to a show uh here in tulsa oklahoma um i have chris benoit's signature on a piece of paper still to this day uh it's terrible what happened with him and his family and uh but i got his signature i gotta watch the big show live i gotta watch uh rod van dam live when I was younger, I'm not too big of a fan now. Uh, yeah. I think I've drifted away from it, especially having two little girls and they're kind of, you know, not into that stuff. They don't even like to watch MMA with me. My wife will watch it a little bit because, you know, I'm always trying to watch the pay-per-views and go and watch <laughs> UFC fights. Um, but I have a whole family of females, so uh, I, I got to watch all the Barbies and uh, do with all the kitty shows a lot. Uh <laughs> Nothing against wrestling. Uh, I think it's a great sport. I ain't got no, but nothing against anybody that does it. I've trained with a few guys that I actually do it themselves and also want to do that as a career. So I, I highly support them just like they highly support me. But it's just not nothing I try to tune into like the Tuesday Night Contender or the UFC right. fight at all. So let me ask you about that. You know, obviously everybody knows, you know, Brock Lesnar had his – pedigree before he fought in the UFC you know you're seeing a lot more guys make the jump from wrestling to MMA or vice versa because at the show we worked in Chicago we interviewed Diamond Dallas Page there in that same day I saw Frank Mir has been doing some wrestling stuff so what are your thoughts on all the crossover that we see between MMA and wrestling these days because Lord knows back when we're talking about the early UFCs you know an MMA guy wouldn't be caught dead doing anything with pro wrestling. And now it seems like those walls have kind of opened up. So what are your thoughts on uh, both the MMA guys that are trying their hand there in wrestling or vice versa, you know, trying to come from wrestling to fighting? Um, I, I think it's great, man. And you got to look at it as a money aspect too, because if you look at WWE fighters coming to MMA, they've already been successful in WWE. So they go into MMA, bring their fan base, and it helps them with the money. You look at Matt Riddle, he's in WWE now as well. And if Frank Mir's getting into it, I know uh, Kane Velasquez got into it as well. Well, he Kane signed Velasquez, with WWE. Yeah, so you look at that, man. Uh, I think more MMA fighters are going to it based on the money aspect because it probably pays way more money 
than when we, what we do in MMA. And uh, in MMA, if you come over from WWE, it's easier for you to make more money, especially if you have a bigger following. So I think it goes both ways. And no matter who you are or which one you're trying to go to, I, I think it's great for the sport on both aspects. Yep. Great answer. I, mean, I, think it's a, I think it's a real good transition for a lot of the older fighters too. I think that's why you're seeing it uh, pop up a lot more with some of the older guys is you're seeing, like you said, they're taking some of their fame almost and kind of transitioning it to something they may have had a passion for throughout their career. So yeah. That that brings up a good question too. As you mentioned, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, getting ready getting ready for a fight, this is something that's different than what you're used to, obviously, with it being under the corona condition and things like that. As we go into this fight, you know, how do it are you somebody that has a lot of pet peeves for fight week? Do you have like any sort of like rituals you do or anything like that? The reason why I ask is because we have a segment on the show called Locker Room Etiquette. We've gotten different things from everybody from Booker T and everybody else. So for Jimmy Flick, as you get ready for a fight, what is what does fight night look for you? Are you a guy that likes to go seclude yourself? Are you a guy that, you know, likes to be around a bunch of people? Like, what, what does fight week and fight day look like for you? Uh, I just like to stay relaxed. Um, I like to get up, have a good breakfast. Um, and then I get a good workout in. I try to go back, take a nap, and uh, just stay relaxed, stay calm, think about the situation, not overthink anything. Um, like I said, I'm pretty established as a human being. So um, going into it, it's just all fun for me, man. I enjoy chasing my dream. Um, and every time I go in, I, I, I say the same prayer, and I, I never pray for victory. I just pray to be able to go back to work, go back to my family without any injuries. Um, and that's about it, man. It, it's just another day for me. Uh, this will be my 20th professional fight. I have seven amateur fights. I have two pro boxing. I have two pro kickboxing, a pro Muay Thai. So I fought in all sports. I've even grappled as a professional grappler. So um, the nerves don't bother me much anymore it's just another day in the world man for me but i just like to stay relaxed and go out there have fun and hopefully come out injury free that that's the main goal all right Corey, we're getting we're getting towards the end of our time so i'm gonna let you get your crack you got anything else for the champ here yeah man um i just was in, incredibly incredibly uh can't, I'm, I'm at a loss for words today. A long day at work, just like you were saying earlier. But um, you just – you had an incredible performance, man, in your last fight, man. It really I, – I think that really popped a lot of eyes on you. Like you said, you, you're you a multiple-time LFA vet. You you know, you were doing really good in the promotion before that. But to, to do what you did in that last fight and just come out and completely dominate in a fight that a lot of people, it seemed like, especially the commentary crew was kind of doubting you going into it. And just the amount of eyes that that grabbed for you and the ability to turn that around so quick, it, it, I really hope the best for you in this contender series fight. Cause I think you could really do something good with the amount of promotion they could do with that. Yeah, man. I appreciate it, man. And, uh, I do too, man. Uh, fighters don't promote like me. LFA took great care of me. They know how I promote them. I tag them in a lot of stuff. I'm very active on social media. I feel more fighters should and not enough fighters are. Um, I, I stay locally here with my gyms. I support the gyms that support me. I don't need to go train and spend all this money to train at high level gyms just to say I train with these big names. Uh, I'm going to make my name from here locally. I want to get bigger and hopefully give back to my city um, and let people know, you know, my story as I grow up. I wasn't a wealthy little kid. I had a lot of older brothers and sisters. Uh, I was poor growing up. Uh, my family were in and out of drugs. Uh, I stayed away from it and I'm still chasing my dream. Uh, I feel I've already accomplished a lot and uh, I'm happy with what I've accomplished, but I'm not done accomplishing everything yet. So uh, hopefully we go get this win and we get this uh, UFC title and the story just keeps going. I mean, I couldn't have said it any better myself, man. We're looking forward to seeing you fight here in the UFC contender series. Um, 
two, I got two last questions for you. So since we're on the contender series, what are your, uh, what are your last thoughts for your opponent? How do you see the fight going? And uh, if you have any last words for him, feel free to let him live. Oh, man, I just want us to bring all the smoke, man. Bring everything you got, man. I know he will. He's a hard fighter. He's a hard trainer. We both got that wrestling grind. So uh, I don't see anything short of an amazing fight. Um, when I predict the fight, I predict a finish. Uh, it doesn't care how. I do not like going to the scorecards. Out of 19 fights, I've only seen the scorecards three times. Uh, two of the times, I beat the same guy twice. And one of my losses... I dominated the guy. It's on UFC Fight Pass on King of the Cage. And uh, I took him down and dominated him every round. But it was in his hometown of Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I lost by a decision somehow. So ever since that fight, I have not seen the scorecards. And I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure I don't go to the scorecards on September 1st, especially in front of Dana White. Because uh, I'm pretty sure that's one of the hardest things to do is to get a contract when you go to the scorecards, unless it's just an amazing fight. So if it does go to the scorecards, I hope me and Nate throw down just like Tony Kelly and his opponent did uh, to start out the UFC fight card, you know? So no matter how the fight goes, I just want it to be fireworks. I want me and Nate to show up. And I feel like no matter who wins, I hope one of us gets the contract and I hope it's an amazing fight. Hey, I like it. And, since you mentioned that you love watching the contender series and all the fights, I got to get your quick thoughts just as a fight fan. First of all, what were your thoughts on the DC Stipe fight? And obviously I don't think anybody saw what happened with O'Malley coming the way it did. So what are your quick thoughts on those fights? And who do you got in the fight that's coming up actually the day after my birthday in Israel Adesanya defending his strap again? And do you see him fighting, you know, do you see him kind of mixing it up? Um, I know there's been talk with him and John Jones, but I know they just said he vacated the title. So what are your thoughts on both of those situations? Um, yeah, with the O'Malley fight, man, uh, I'm just curious if maybe the guy cuts too much weight to 35 and maybe it affected his bones. That's why maybe the leg kick, uh, you know, caused some nerve damage when he got kicked. Um, so some fighters, you know, based on your, uh, your build and stuff, you got to find the white, right weight class for you. You know, and the DC fight, I think the first round started out great. I think the second round, you know, he got a little comfortable, but then when he got dropped, uh, everything changed. Uh, I think the decision was correct. I think uh, Stiepe earned it. I, I'm excited to see him and Francis fight again because Francis Ngannou has been on a terror. And when Stiepe fights him, you know, he's got to use his wrestling. There's no standing and banging with Francis oh, Ngannou. Oh, hell no no matter who you are. So um, I, I'm excited about that. And the Alessandro and Costa fight, uh, I honestly think it's going to work against Costa because Costa goes straight forward and Alessandro is long and he likes to uh, use his defense to land his strikes. And uh, I think that's going to work out in his favor. Uh, I think he should stay at 85. He's still early in his career. Agreed. There's no reason to go up or do anything like that yet. And uh, – I think John Bones Jones, I love the guy, but he's kind of hurting himself, you know? So I don't see him getting the heavyweight title shot anytime soon. I honestly see him going to Bellator. And every time we see these guys go from UFC to Bellator, it has not been good. So I think they lose a lot of their love. And I think they're going to Bellator based on the fact that they can support sponsors and make more money. So it's more of a money decision than chasing your career. I mean, he's been the light heavyweight champ forever. Technically doesn't even have a loss. His one loss was wrong. And uh, he dominated Matt Hamill. So I think he's just going to go to Bellator for the money. And that's all he's chasing now is money fights. He's not chasing to solidify his, uh, his, his legacy. You know, his legacy exactly so uh i think it's changing him you know so uh but i'm excited to see what happens and uh I i'm really excited for that alisonia versus costa fight because if anybody can put alisonia out it's gonna be costa hey i like that see now that's an angle to this i haven't looked at i thought about jones going to heavyweight or even fighting again at light heavy because i feel like some of it's kind of smoke and mirrors but i didn't think about him going to bellator simply for the fact that 
I just find it hard to believe that the UFC would let him go. Because one of the things that was a big story for me with UFC 252, Corey, you can attest to this because you were watching it with me. My first thought when Sean O'Malley lost was, damn, does that screw the UFC? Here's why. Because as many people know, obviously John Jones hasn't been fighting that often. Conor McGregor hasn't fought in how long. Ronda Rousey went to WWE. Sean O'Malley was arguably the biggest name that they had as far as just people knowing who he was and people want to see him fight. And with having him lose, when you build him up against a guy like Cheeto Vera, who wasn't any slouch either, you got two guys that are both on their way up. Now it's going to be real interesting. And I think we're going to see what Sean O'Malley's really made of because we're going to see if he can come back and fight like he was before, or does losing like that in a way that was maybe a little bit out of his control by getting hurt. Does that shake him? I mean, hey, that makes for a lot of good fights. I think Adesanya is going to win this fight as well. Corey, I think you'd probably agree. And you'll have to stay tuned to our picks so you don't miss it. Before we get let you get out of here, man, one more time, throw out your social media and let everybody know where they can find you and when and where they can watch you fight on Dana White's Contender Series. Yes, uh, y'all can follow me on Twitter at Jimmy the Brick Flick, or uh, on Twitter at Jimmy Flick. You can follow me on Facebook, social media, my fan page, Jimmy the Brick Flick. Uh, I have over 3,000 followers. My actual Facebook, Jimmy Flick, is uh, maxed out at 5,000. So if you can just go give me a follow at Jimmy the Brick Flick, I'd really appreciate it. I do giveaways all the time, I'm always signing posters, giving gloves away, whatever I can to get more fans. And then my Instagram is the uh, underscore brick underscore MMA. So I appreciate everybody that follows me. September 1st, tune in. I'll be fighting 6-0 Nate Smith to earn that UFC contract. Hey, man. And uh, if tonight's any – I mean, tonight's been a big night for us over here at Knockouts and Three Counts. Kenny went and picked himself up a dub on the Contender Series. Past guest of the show, Rohit Raju is over here winning X Division titles, and I'm calling it right here, right now. My man Jimmy Flick is going to go get himself a fucking contract come September 1st. We bring titles over here at Knockouts and Three Counts, and that's why you need to be subscribed so you don't miss any of the great content. Shout out to everybody that watches us, whether it's Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, all the motherfuckers. You can find them all at ko3cpod.com. And, Jimmy, I just want to thank you so much for your time, brother, man. You already know we're going to be tuned in watching you. And, hey, like I said, from now on, man, you're family. So we're in the corner. Like I said, good luck come September 1st, brother, man. I thank y'all. I appreciate y'all having me on. I appreciate the support, and I can't wait, man. Hey, stay right, tuned, man. man. We'll definitely bring you back at some point. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Thanks for coming on, brother, yet again. Best of luck, man. Can't wait. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Y'all have a good night. Yeah, Likewise. Too. Well, Corey, Jimmy Flick, man, and like I said, until you see us next week and in the in-between time, thank you guys for watching us once again here at Knockouts and Three Counts. And until next time, Corey, there ain't nothing left to say, so peace. Later.